bringing up are just very keen. It shows that the Holy Spirit has been teaching you. And the more you stay open in your mind to the, to the voice of the Spirit, and, and you know that can, can be a deep spiritualization without uh, evidence, or it, it can be explained, and I think I can explain it. The more you hear this message and read it from the Word, the more you'll hear the voice of the Holy Spirit that's already in your soul mind. That's where He is, and that's where He operates. And the more you see Christ in the Word, the more you enliven the Holy Spirit to speak only of Him. You see, we, we are always saying the Spirit said this and the Spirit said that, but what we, I've always felt like most people just had inclinations, maybe spiritual inclinations, but it wasn't really the teaching of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> because the, Jesus said when He teaches, He's going to speak only of me. And so the more you see Jesus as your life and see Christ in the Word, the more you enliven that Holy Spirit to work in your mind. He's not going to fight your past thoughts. He won't fight the old man syndrome, the old way of doing things. But he'll wait for you to see Jesus, and when you see Jesus, he'll reveal him more and more until you'll be able to have that knowing, a knowing. It may not be a voice. It, it won't be a streak of uh, lightning, but it'll be a voice that you recognize as a knowing. The deeper you get into the Christ life, the more a knowing is going to take place in you. It's just, it's just something you know. It's not necessarily a feeling. Uh, sometimes you'll have feeling from it. Sometimes you won't. That bothered me right at first because I was used in uh, spirit-filled circles getting a lot of feeling to prove what it was that was happening. But now, as you become more and more a knower, you depend less and less on feeling, and it, it becomes a knowing. Like, I'm not excited, using my homily as I talk of all the time, I don't get excited thinking how two and two is four. That just doesn't excite me. It's just a fact. Well, now that I see Christ in me, I'm not so excited about it as it has become a fact. And as some of you are beginning to use in your, in your conversation, it's spontaneous now. Just like I immediately see two and two makes four, that's spontaneous in my knowing. And so it is with Christ in you. It finally becomes a very spontaneous uh, thing. It's a knowing that you come to. So I encourage you to, to continue to see Christ in the Scriptures. You, you can't get away from the Word. The Word is this written book as well as the Word is in you and the two of them get together, well, you have the explosion of truth. The Holy Spirit works from that. The Holy Spirit works from your seeing Christ in all things. So the more you see Christ, the more the Holy Spirit will be enlivened to, to bring him forth. You see, all our days we have uh, wrestled with, with uh, truth. It's truth we wrestle with. Uh, when we didn't have feeling to our faith, we wrestle with the truth of what that faith was being placed in. We've always needed some kind of feeling to know whether it was really working or not. And the more feeling we had, the more we were able to declare that it was so. But now we see truth as a person. Jesus said, I am the truth. And with this Christ in us, truth is not a thing separated from us, but it's an innate part of us. It's just that our minds haven't received it yet. It is my feeling that as natural as your natural life is to you, so did God intend that Christ in you be natural, that it just be ordinary. That the, that the Christ in you would be so ordinary you wouldn't think of God not being your father any more than you would think your natural parents didn't bring you into the world. It would just be natural. There would not be a comprehension necessary. There would not be a mystery to be unfolded about it. It would just be a natural thing. But the, the facts are that natural way of living Christ, spontaneously expressing Christ, 
has been hard to come by because of our past. The fact is, for a long time, we had living within us in our container, Satan, and he kept us from truth. He kept us from this knowing. He kept us from the knowing by doing something that was adverse to knowing. Now, look at uh, that in the light of this illustration. A man who has great knowledge and education and lives by that knowledge and education doesn't have to do a whole lot of works to put it all together. He's a knower. And a fellow that doesn't have a lot of education, as you well know, has to do a lot of hard work to put life together. That's very evident in our world today, for we have multitudes of young people who are not getting an education and are even having a hard time finding work-type jobs. Even a hard work job is hard for some to find these days. But if you don't, if, you, if you're not a knower, you're going to work at it very hard. Now that's what's happened to Christians. When we come to where we don't know who we are in Christ and don't know about this life in Christ, we do a lot of work to make up for it. Uh, we assume that, that God can be loved through our works, and by us loving him through our works, he will cause to happen what it is we need. But the end result is we are misled because we don't understand love. We understand working far more than we do loving. Uh, I heard on a radio today about... Uh, somebody over in Portland who was selling uh, jewelry uh, and said if you've been mistreating your wife or you're having a uh, fuss with your wife come in and buy a piece of jewelry as if the doing of that would make up for this breach in marital separation in, 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 in mind separation from each other and I thought that's the way we all are we all had rather do something than come to the knowing of who and what we are. As, as I've often said, people who get out of uh, fellowship with the Lord, first thing they think of is, I need to get back in the church. I need to do something. Uh, I need to pray. I need to, get hold of the, I need to get hold of God. I need to get, find somebody who can get hold of God for me or something. They feel they must do something because that's very innate in every one of us, this this feeling of doing something. Well, that feeling came about because Satan in us was the doer. Now, you know in our study we have uh, scripture for that where Jesus says in John 8 that Satan was the father from the beginning of the human being and that John finally says again in his epistle that it was Satan who was a sinner from the beginning. And so we can assume by that that he was the doer in the human being that caused us to do things and caused us to do erroneous things contrary to what even was good for us because he was the doer. Well, that's fixed in us. That, that's in every one of us. And when we get born again, our mind is still fixed in that way. And that's, that's what I think Paul called the old man, the old way of doing things. Well, it has been on my mind for a long time about how all this come about and, and every shred of uh, history I could get a hold of or anything I could read on this particular subject about how it is that what God wanted us to be as knowers got lost and all of God's plan ended up in a doer religion. And that has really uh, bored in on me, so to speak, and, and I'm going to try to uh, unravel some of it here this evening as I talked to you. I talked a little bit about it in camp meeting, but it's, it's such an awesome subject and I have such a little hold on it that uh, I thought I would e expose some of my feelings about it in this group this evening because it has to do with what is happening to us. You see, a, a marvelous and great thing has happened to us. God has restored what I think is his original plan in this message that he has allowed us to come to. It is a message that has been hidden for centuries. But we have to have a bit of historical understanding about that. When, the, when God drew up his plan, we have uh, established as best we could in the fundamentals of the Christ life the fact that uh, 
everything God planned for human beings was, was put to work before the creation of the world. So what happened before the creation of the world was that God had a plan. He had a, a plan. Let's, let's say his plan here. And his plan was based on what we now see to be these three categorical scriptures of Ephesians 1 and 4, Roman, uh, Revelation 13 and 8, and Hebrews 4 and 3, of the things that was in God's mind before the creation of the world. So obviously these things was in his plan. His plan was that it was already finished. And if his plan was already finished in his mind, then all the human being had to do to participate in this plan was to come to know about it. That's all he needed to do was to come to know about this, this plan. And so this, this plan is made up of, uh, as we said, of uh, Ephesians 1 and 4 and Revelation 13 and 8. I really want that before you because these, these three texts are so important. In Hebrews 4 and 3, his plan is drawn. It, it, is, it is crystallized in God's mind. The whole of his intention is stated. And so he, he creates a man. He creates uh, Adam in his own likeness and image and puts him in this garden. But what God wants is not for Adam to just come to know what this plan is. What God really wants is by this plan to get something he's never had out of a creature. What is it God never got out of a creature? That was love. Lucifer didn't love him. The angels that were fallen didn't love him. But God is love and God cannot be honored or worshipped except in love. So the whole of God's plan finally centered in love. He wants a creature that loves him. But he realizes that if he creates a creature that is made to love him, that is created to love him, he won't get the kind of love he wants or the kind of God he is in love. So he must create a creature that can make choice. We've established that. To make a choice to love him. Because God made a choice to give us love. Where was his choice? He chose us in Christ. He killed Christ in his mind that we might enter into that rest of knowing that the works were finished. So he wants us to come to that kind of love. Now, everybody talks about four kinds of love, and we say this is agape love, but it's really deeper than that. Because what it is, it is the kind of love God is reciprocating back to him from us. So God saw that he could not create a creature to love him. So what he would have to do is create a creature and give that creature a contrast because he needed opposites to be able to make the choice for the kind of love God wanted. This kind of love comes out of a choice as we've seen. So now Adam in his creation must make this choice. He must come to this kind of choice. So what God did was an awesome thing. In his beautiful creation, he created the two trees. And Adam now had a choice. But God said, that's, that's, not, that's not good enough, my, my way of putting it. God said, the choice can't be that simple. It's got to be a deeply penetrating choice because I want them to make not just a choice but a commitment to love me. I want them to make the same kind of commitment to love me I made to love them which required the death of Jesus. So a commitment has in its uh, proverbial definition death committed unto death. That's what real spiritual commitment is unto death because God made that kind of commitment to a human being whenever he drew up this plan. So what he did, he said to Adam, 
that I do not want you to eat of the fruit of this tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, that's different from just having a choice between two trees. That's different because he said, the moment you eat of the fruit of this tree, you're going to die. You're going to die. So he added a depth to the contrast that bordered the kind of commitment God had made to give us Christ as our salvation. So what God really did there was not just to create the opposites, but what he did was God established the first law. So whatever we think about law, it's a God-established thing. And certainly the Apostle Paul said that when he said the law is not evil. It's not good, but it's not evil. It won't help you a lot, but it's not evil. The law is good. Why? Because it shows us our sin. So what the Lord did was to institute a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, what really happened here was that when God instituted this law, that made the tree enticing. How could that tree become enticing to one who had no feeling about trees or anything else other than what God had told him? Because all he had in his mind is what God had been teaching him as he came down and walked and talked with him. So we enter in to this picture of Satan. It was Satan, therefore, that intensified this picture. It was Satan who said, now, God didn't really mean what he said. Oh, uh, Satan said he said it, but he didn't really mean it quite like you've taken it, Adam. Because he said, I guess God is a little jealous. That seems to be the, the hidden point there. And he doesn't want you to be as God, because if you eat of this tree, you'll be as a God yourself. And so Adam was deceived. Adam and Eve were deceived. When they were deceived, the deceiving had come about by their doing. By their doing something that they were not supposed to do. Now, this brings to the picture an important factor. What if Adam had not eaten of any tree. Let's suppose that first. What if he had not eaten of either tree? What would he have been? He would have been a knower. Why do I say that? Because all he knew at that time was what God had given him. He didn't know anything else. So if he had done nothing, he would have been much better off. Of course, if he had eaten of the tree of life, he would have become eternal. He would have had Christ in him from the beginning, which God said was his intention. But the facts were, when Adam disobeyed God, took, Adam's, took Satan's note, and acted upon it, he became the producer, with Satan's help, of another way of serving God. And so a whole other channel was created that I call one of the two streams of understanding God. A stream was created of doer religion. Its master force was Satan and always has been. But it has never been bad. That is real bad. It's always been close to truth. It's always been almost good. It's been Satan saying, 
what God said slightly twisted. It's been God's word slightly twisted so that an unknowledgeable person would think it was truth. And so from the very beginning, human beings had instilled in them doer religion. Do something and you'll be. Well, right from the beginning, this pure stream of knowers that had to do with God's plan was literally set aside. Everything God planned here in the beginning was set aside for the next 4,300 years. We've studied that. Takes in the five dispensations, five different ways that God dealt with man. But what really was going on was that God was attempting to get the attention of all Adamites once again that they would come to a knowing of what it was God was doing rather than they doing something themselves that made them feel better. Well, the end result was that doer religion never did bring about the love that God needed. It never did. For 4,300 years, it didn't bring about the ultimate love that God needed. The reason for that is that God had already created man to make a choice. And when man made his choice against God's plan and accepted Satan's word, from then on, all of the children of Adam, the whole human race, was influxed and bound by this thing that we must do something to be who we are. Do something and you'll be as gods. All God wanted us to know was what he had done for us placed us in Christ, killed a lamb to make it possible, and allowed us to enter into his rest. That's all God wanted us to know. That's the simplicity of his plan. But instead of the human race coming to know that, nor religion was displaced for 4,300 years. Well, you've heard the story told uh, many times before about how in the 4,300 years, every person who was destined to please God had to finally enter into this plan of God in some way. The ultimate way was the killing of an innocent substitute to point them to Christ's death. The reason why every one of them from Abraham on had to offer these sacrifices was because Life comes out of death, and God wanted to show them that he had already killed a lamb in order that they be what they were supposed to be. Well, what generated during these 4,300 years was a feeling that we must do this to please God. <coughs> and so still lost was the ultimate intention of God that man within himself would come to see and know that Christ was his only life. Well, what finally happened was that Jesus came and Christ died. When Christ died on the cross, it was God's whole intention that there would be a restoral of his plan. We use a very pertinent verse in, in, uh, in John uh, 14 and 20, where Jesus says that on that day, the day of Pentecost, let's say, you're going to know that I'm in you and you're in me. When that day comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, the theme of that 14th chapter is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he says, when the Holy Spirit has come, you're going to know that I'm in you and you're in me. Well, what is he saying there? For the first time in history, God is jerking the human race back from doer religion to being knowers. Not doing something, but knowing something. Well, as you know, the day of Pentecost came and went, and that never was exposed. 
And it's an awesome thing to me that by Paul's own words, at least five times God had hidden this glorious plan from the human race. And Jesus said it was to be restored on the day of Pentecost. It never happened. So there was some sort of feeling in the early church, as we call it, a feeling there by some that they should have known what God is doing. They should have understood what God is doing. Well, the end result was that Peter and James and John at that time didn't see and know what it was God was doing. And so it was some years later that God arrested the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, and he was converted, and I think some three years later received a revelation of Christ in him. Now that's the essence of this gospel where we are proclamating, this truth that we must bring to every hungry heart. It was not then until the Apostle Paul was raised up that we really came to understand what God's plan was. Paul, by his own words, says that no one in the past has received this information I have received from God. So without that information of who we are in Christ, there was nothing left but doer religion, that men do things to please God. Now, ironically, God received this. He accepted that. In the Old Testament, God had fixed it, so that's all they could do was to do something to please him. But after the day of Pentecost, it was Christ in them, their hope of glory, but they didn't have that message until Paul came along. Well, now with the Apostle Paul, let's, let's carry this stream on a little further. The Apostle Paul continued this message of nor Christianity. That's a, just a, a term I get it, give it. Knowledge of who they were in Christ was a predominant factor of Christianity. This is why we stress in our Christ life teaching that the four most important words Paul uses are knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and revelation. Those are words that he interchangeably uses all the way through his writings. Why? He's raised up by God to bring forth that fact of truth about God and about his plan. And you can't read, uh, I haven't checked this thoroughly often, I'm saying it, but uh, I haven't checked it uh, completely, but at one time I came up with the idea that in every 10 verses of Paul's writings, you're going to come across one of these words or the theme of one of these words because Paul knows that everything that has to do with our relationship with God depends on our coming to know Christ, coming to know him. And he'll either say we must learn this or we must study this or we must, we must do something that is a mind challenge in order for us to come to the knowledge of who and what we are in Christ. So the Apostle Paul continued this knower truth down through the ages. Well, running along side to side with this was doer religion. At the beginning of the early church, doer religion was propagated by Peter. Peter and James especially. The Judaizers were there. We'll talk about that a little later. But doer religion was perpetuated by these men. They were the ones who said, if you do something, if you do it the way we say to do it, you'll be pleasing to God and you'll be happy within yourself. So Peter established this stream of doer religion in the church. That's why even to this day, Romanism declares him to be the first pope because he is the one who established doer religion. But the Apostle Paul continued with the message that I know in whom I have believed. Coming to know Christ as your life was his theme.
<coughs> now with this idea before us, <coughs> it is obvious that great leadership came through Peter and probably great leadership <coughs> through the Apostle Paul. But when these two men passed off the scene, Peter and Paul both died somewhere around 70 A.D. <coughs> they both died the same year. And with their death, there was left only the disciples of these men to carry on. And this is a thing <coughs> I really wanted to get to and bring to you. Within a hundred years after the death of these two men, Christianity had reverted back to an almost total doer religion. It had so reverted back that a couple hundred years after the birth of Christ, a church was established that was so powerful that it said that unless you do what we say for you to do in this church, you cannot be saved. And by this, everything that was in God's original plan was literally lost. The believer chosen in Christ. Christ's death that God might have the right to rebirth us. And the entering into that rest. So finally, what had happened was that dual religion became so predominant by Constantine's ad, uh, de declaration that all in the Roman Empire shall be Christian. And the Christian church became so big and powerful that dual religion was snuffed out. The small voices that were left saying, Christ in you, your hope of glory, were stilled and stopped. A leader by the name of Irenaeus took it upon himself to stand against every knower, those who said, we know who we are by Christ in us. He took it upon himself to stand against them and became a great voice in the early Christian church. Now these were Christians. I'm not saying that they were they were not Christians. They were all Christians. But they became so vociferous and mean toward those who were knowers. Why is it they would be against those who were knowers? Because even in the second century, the knowers said, it isn't going to church. It isn't sitting under the preachers. It isn't listening to the priest. It isn't us doing anything that makes us Christian. We're a Christian because Christ is in us. The knower said, we draw our strength from the Christ that is in us, not from what it is we do. Not from where it is we go. Not from whom it is we sit under. We draw our strength from Christ. Now these knowers were not, as early church history declares, not mean, but they were so pushed about and ostracized and persecuted that many of them finally were pushed away from Christian truth and the Bible as we know it and became what the early church called Gnostics who were not scriptural in many of the things they did. So what had happened was that this vein of truth where God's plan was predominant for the human race once again when restored by the Apostle Paul was lost. It was as if it was overruled by dual religion. And God's own people overruled it by saying we must do something in order to please God. Well, that persisted through the ages. Finally, in 1500, when Martin Luther came against that dual church and said that we are not saved by what we do in the church, we are saved by faith, justified by Christ. 
the first step was made toward restoring men to what was God's plan. But sad to say, for the next 450 years at least, more than that up to our date, times had put into mind the mind of men such a great and forceful doer religion that what God's intention was had never surfaced, never come about. I tell this story and take time for it that you might have some feeling for what God is doing today. That you might understand why we're in this room and why I'm not on uh, network television and all over the nation by radio telling this story. It is because the awesome force of doer religion has always stood against the knowers in Christ. I tell the story because I want you to see that it is no simple thing God is doing in your life and mine. That it is an awesome thing. That as we sit and talk and think about what we're learning and seeing by the Spirit, it almost scares us at times. We have no great backing. Never will. Knowledge, the knowers who know God's plan, never needed anything institutionally to continue. They never needed it. And that was why institutionalized religion stood against them in the earliest days, why Arrhenius took such a stand against them, because he saw that if every believer knew who they were in Christ, they wouldn't need the hierarchy, we wouldn't need the, the great priesthood, we wouldn't need the covering that hierarchy puts over us, we wouldn't need the institutionalized religion. They saw this, and so they worked at doing all they could to destroy it. Down through the ages, there have been men in these last 2,000 years who have caught glimpses and pieces and parts of what it is we're seeing now. And some of them, like Jacob Burmer, probably saw it much clearer than we see it now. But they stood alone, and they're ostracized and, and unaccepted. I read theology constantly. And there's a strange thing I've noted in theology that theologians never come up with something fresh out of God's Word. They only quote each other. They only say what each other believes. You can take a good commentary book and the man in the commentary when it comes to a verse will quote what others have said about that verse. The reason for that is dual religion is such a force that even when it comes in the name of grace, it deviates. Because doer religion must have doers to perpetuate man-made doctrines. But the knowers have finally settled down to knowing in whom they have believed. That's what Paul said. I know who I have believed in. It is John saying then that our only doctrine is that who. Our only doctrine is that whom I have believed in. That's our only doctrine. Well, we're a distance from that ourselves. In fact, a long way. But we're moving into that. And the reason today God sort of keeps us underground, so to speak, and I'm, I'm thankful for this. I was talking to a very noted person not long ago and who sees many of these truths, and he said, I can see that God has kept these truths underground for now. And I thought, why was that? And then I realized it was as the Spirit has given me many times we're foundation stones. And the building that will be built is going to be built on these who stand now. But you see what happened is that in our day, it may have been before our day, but I see no continuity and I read no writings of it. But in our day, God has surfaced the knowers once again. See, in our day, I was talking with Norman Grubb some uh, years ago, and in our conversation, we both came to an agreement that in 1980, God might have done something that had not been done since the days of the Apostle Paul. And that was, he had given liberty for men to be able to teach and to talk of this marvelous thing of God's eternal plan in operation 
and raise up a people who know who they are in Christ without any other subsistence other than that spirit-taught knowledge. Well, I'm not sitting here saying that uh, 1980 is a great date like uh, Luther's, what was it, 1535 or Lateran outpour in 1900. But it's just entirely possible we may look back should the Lord delay his coming that in the year 1980, our father elected to restore Noah's to his plan. And that the day had come when he was going to raise up a people who would know in whom they had believed and put no works before that. But who on the other hand, when they came to know who they were in Christ, would never be lacking in works or fruit, gifts or ministry but they would know who they were in Christ. They would need no outside thing to embellish their relationship with God. You see, that's what happened when Satan deceived Adam and Eve. Satan said, if you eat of the fruit of this tree, you'll be as God. Well, ironically, the fruit of that tree was another knowledge. It was a knowledge whereby you only have this beautiful fruit. You only get this good fruit if you reach out, take it, and eat it. Doer religion. The doing of it was self-effort, which every human being has fixed in them to do. We'd like to do something about the situation. I get antsy sometimes. I see something not going right, and I want to do something about it right off because it's in us to do that. But to sit and rest and know that God is the doer and that he will work it out because all his works are finished is difficult on us because we haven't come to that knowing as we should. But that knowledge of good and evil was an antithesis to God's plan. What is the knowledge of good and evil? It is doing good and not doing evil. That's religiousized knowledge of good and evil. Many times we call it uh, sense knowledge. Why sense knowledge? Because it's outer knowledge. It's knowledge where you have to smell it, see it, feel it, hear it, touch it, taste it, or touch it. You have to do something in order for it to work. Well, this is the deceit that Satan has brought to the body of Christ today. It is this knowledge of good and evil that has produced doing religion. Now, don't mistake me. Multitudes of doers in doer religion are born again. See, they're spirit filled. They do more than anyone. It was declared by Clement in uh, around 200 when he was embattled with uh, Arrhenius, who was set to destroy the knowers and Paul's uh, disciples. Clement uh, declared that uh, the knowers were beset against because the doers had to do anything they could to perpetuate their own works. That they could not stand for someone to come to knowing without doing it their way. Thus, we had the establishment of denominationalism. Because one man come along and said, let's do it this way. He read the scriptures, interpreted it this way. Good, good. He was a Christian. Another man come along. He was a Christian. He said, let's do it this way. And so the scriptures became the criterion because the knowledge that men had taken, even though they had the miracle of regeneration in them, the knowledge that they had taken was a knowledge we must do something to be good. We must do something to not be evil. So the mechanism was set up to make that work. The mechanism was, you go do this. You go to church. You read your Bible. You pray. Uh, the, the early Roman church, uh, uh, I don't know whether you ever saw one of those or not. I bought, a, I bought a Catholic college one time up in Canada for one of our schools, and it had a, uh, it had a prayer trail. You ever see a prayer trail? It, uh, it took in uh, three or four acres. Uh, where you would go from one prayer station to another and it'd have little booths there with different idols in it. 
and you would pray to this saint, and then you'd go walk a little while further meditating, and you'd pray to another, and you'd pray to another. And uh, that was awesome. I had never seen anything like that. But that was doer religion. Do good. And don't do evil. Doing. So what happened was a whole framework was created to embrace this doer religion. This is what you and I have grown up in. I grew up in good Baptist churches and good Pentecostal churches. I mean good churches, God-fearing, loving people who knew no different. But everything we did was a part of that dual religion. Don't do evil, do good. And never coming to know who we were, yet we had Christ in us. So the marvel of all this is that God, by his grace, has surfaced once again this stream that flows out of the Apostle Paul. You know, ironically, something comes to my mind. Many years ago, must have been back in the 50s, before I had a revelation of Christ, I held a meeting in Chicago. I don't even remember. I was in a church there. And one night, I heard a ruckus, a big ruckus out in the vestibule of that church. A bunch of people was out there arguing. And I was going back to my hotel room, and so I just skirted on the outside of them. But I paused a moment to listen to that argument. And what I was hearing was somebody in that group was saying that if you people don't listen to what the Apostle Paul says and discount a whole lot of things you believe, you're not going to please God. That stuck with me. But you know what? I was mad. I thought, anybody that says that's crazy, why didn't he talk about Christ? Now it comes back to me. There was a little voice speaking up who said there's something about what Paul said we must listen to. Now you and I are those people who are listening to what Paul says. We're not discounting anything that Jesus said. It fits. We're not discounting anything in the Old Testament. It's a part of 4,300 years of proving our need of knowing Christ is in us. But what we are saying is that we are now listening intently to what Paul has to say. We're listening intently to the one man to whom God gave the revelation. He never gave it to Peter. He never gave it to John. He never gave it to James. He never gave it to another person. And either that's very important to the whole of what God is doing that releases and liberates and sets mankind free, or this whole book is a farce. The Apostle Paul never takes the place of Jesus Christ. That was never God's intention. It was God's intention that the Apostle Paul be a raised up voice to tell humanity that Christ is their life. That's simple, isn't it? But coming to that's been very difficult. And our difficulty has been that this stream of truth we call doer religion is so predominant and so fixed in us that when the Holy Spirit would like to tell us that we're in Christ and Christ is in us, he can't get past our doing, our works, our understanding, our old way of doing things. And so now God has raised up a people. Oh, I rejoice in what God is doing. Amen. We've, we've taken great steps of faith first six months of this year will be, yeah, next week, first six months. Last fall, Robbie and I said, we've got to go east. We felt a real burden. She felt the burden longer than I did. I was kind of content. I didn't want to buy it off any more than I was doing. But my dear wife felt the burden. She said, we're getting letters and calls. We've got groups over there that are in tele under videos and in classes, and they're anxious to see us. They've never seen us. We've got to go over and see them. That's east, going east of Dallas. We finally went. And what we've done, we've ended up with six new classes and changed our schedule all around. So it's been a marvel what God has done. On our second weekend of the month now, we go to, uh, on a Saturday night, we're in Cleveland, Ohio. On Sunday night, we're in Boston and Plymouth. And on uh, Monday night, we're in Hartford, Connecticut. Three wonderful doors open, and these are good, strong groups at the present time. But these are people 
who are not necessarily knowers at this time, but what they are is sick and tired of doer religion. We've just, we've just caught a group of people at that juncture. They're sick and tired of doer religion. Some of them don't know what's going to happen to them. No two ways about it. They really don't know what they're getting into. Some of them are very cautious, and even saying, what are we getting into? But we leave it hanging, because what they're getting into must come by the word, must come as truth evolves in their thinking, as Christ comes alive in them. But we have seen these doors opened by hungry people, and it is significant because all around us are these hungry people. They're all around you here. There are people <laughs> who know that doer religion is not the answer, but they're so locked into church programs. And as you know from our teaching, I don't like to use the term church program because we are the church, people of the church. Uh, they're locked into these building programs is what they really are. And where there are doctrines and programs that are run out of these buildings by ministries. And that's not a derogatory statement because the church of Jesus Christ goes to those buildings and participates in those ministries. But we really need to get it clear in our mind that what we call the church is the body of Christ and members in particular and not the buildings that are being perpetuated under the name of doer religion. I want to get fixed in you two things by this talk tonight. The first thing is I want you to see that God is reestablishing the knower truth. It's not religion. Christ has nothing to do with religion. Do you understand that? I I'm trying to get people everywhere to see that. That Jesus Christ has nothing to do with religion. He has nothing to do with churchianity. He's the life of the believer. He's the life of those who have believed in Christ. He doesn't come through the channel of a church or a ministry. He's God's gift to humanity. Whosoever believeth can be saved. And so the first thing, an important thing, that I want you to see tonight is that God has reestablished this stream of truth, and we're part of it. We're not important. We're not elite. We're not great, because God's always had to go after the Joshua and Caleb's instead of the ten big elders that held the weight. But we are that group. We're the Anna and Simeon's who will not depart until we see Christ in his fullness. We are the Apostle Paul who has determined to know nothing save Christ and him crucified. We're not Paul, but we're in that spirit. So that's the first important thing I want you to be gripped with this evening, that we are coming into that stream. The second thing is to see the importance of Paul's message. All our life we have concentrated on the four Gospels as the Gospel message. All of our lives we have only gone to the epistles for church doctrine. That's basically how most ministers look at the epistle, place where we get our doctrine. But it isn't that way with me anymore. The four Gospels tell us the story of Jesus of Nazareth, but there's no life in the story of Jesus of Nazareth until he dies for the life comes out of death, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. It is only when we get to the epistles that we begin to see the message. The message is there, so strong. John says in his first chapter, first epistle, this then is the message. It is a message that God has to give us. Why is it a message? Why is Jesus called the Word? In the beginning was the word. Why is it Hebrews says that in the last days saith the Lord, I'll not speak through prophets, but only by my son. Because God has a message in his plan to give the human race, and they must come to know it, that in their knowing of it, they'll be receivers of God's intention. You understand that? When you come to know him, you'll love him. You'll want him because he will fulfill the missing part of you. So for that reason, we turn to the Apostle Paul to see what it is that has to be said. He is the one God gave the message to to clarify it for us. I can read about Abraham and see the failure of Abraham. Fifty years God took to train him and final, final act of training on Mount Moriah and the proposed killing of Isaac and him showing the innocent substitute caught in the bush as his way 
of obeying God. All the way from that through to Christ dying on the cross, we have God's plan unfolded. It's rich and real, and we get a lot of good out of it. But it is only when we listen to the Apostle Paul that we become the knowers God intended that we be. Now, with that in our minds, see how I'm doing here. Can't see. With that in our minds, we're going to make a study, a new and a fresh, of Paul's gospel. The gospel, I have found out, is a hard thing to come to know about. I think I've mentioned it to you here before, evangelical circles are having a real uh, fuss, let's say, Christian type fuss, over what is the gospel right now. They really are having a problem settling this, and I've, I've uh, read at least uh, three books that have been written on the subject in the last year, and I'm sure there are many more because they're all coming out with their sides, and uh, they don't know what the gospel is. And in nothing I've read have they come up with this answer of what is the gospel. What really is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, when I make the term gospel of Jesus Christ, you immediately think the gospel that comes from the historical record of Jesus Christ. But that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not the gospel. What Jesus did in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what he did in those three historical Gospels is the record of something he did, not who he is, and consequently is not the Gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God under salvation. In other words, what Jesus did short of his death, burial, and resurrection is not the Gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God under salvation. Now that's a bit radical, and we need to talk about it, and I intend to, because that's the reason why the church today does not have a strong flow of knower believers, those who have come to knowing who they are in Christ. We're being raised up, we're being challenged, and we're being taught by the Spirit, but I hope to challenge you this night in a deeper way than ever before to see who and what we are and what God is doing. We'll take our break right here.